Hello, everybody. First, I would like first to thank the Maritime Foundation in the world, of which I'm part, for having given me the impossible task of getting you hooked to Maronite history and Maronite and Christian options just before lunch. <laughs> so for all, for all of those who are going to listen when there's extra food in a few moments. I would also say how much pride I have to be amongst you today. Some of you I know and most of you I don't know. But, but I would really like to tell you that very often when I met with the diaspora in Latin America, in Australia, in the US, I found Lebanon in this diaspora sometimes more than I find Lebanon in Lebanon. So we're all very proud of you. And you are the perfect example that Lebanon is much more than a country. It's a message and it's an identity. I would like today to talk to you, or my conference will be, about on the title The Journey of Resistance and Coexistence, Lebanese Christians and Today's Challenges. So part of it will be a little bit about our history, our common history, and part of it will be tackling in light of this history, what should be our options and choices to face today's challenges that are uh, serious challenges for our identity and our country. My fellow Lebanese, dear friends, as I stand here today, the last few Christians who still reside in the Iraqi city of Mosul are leaving it, bringing to an end a presence that dates back to more than 2,000 years ago. The number of Christians in the city of Homs have dwindled from, uh, from about 160,000 three years ago to less than 1,000 today. Not to mention the declining number of Christians and impact, the declining numbers and impact of Christians in Palestine, Jordan, and Egypt. Christians in Lebanon, however, still stand firm in face of today's challenges. Why? What's so different about Lebanese Christians? Why did we succeed in preserving our freedom, democracy, and pluralism at a time when other Christian communities in the region could not? Why did we demonstrate such resilience despite all the tragedies that Lebanon and the region have been going through. The answer is simple. Our presence and attachment to this land is not only the result of a historical coincidence. We chose this land, fought for it, and paid a heavy price to turn it into a land for the free, of the free. Not only for us, but for all those seeking freedom, diversity, and democracy. We should never forget that if we are today in Lebanon, equal partners in decision making, free to express our opinion, to practice our faith, to choose our way of life, to go to the beaches, to parties, to enjoy freedom of press, a free market economy, and a proper, proper education. We owe all this to the vision, choices, and sacrifices of your and our ancestors. It is in these mountains, right behind you, that our ancestors, our ancestors, chose to resist Islamic conquests, spending more than 1100 years relocating from one grotto to another in defiance of persecution, while all other non-Muslim communities across the region succumbed to one of three choices either to convert to Islam, or to flee, or to become second-class citizens, citizens between brackets, because at the time there were no countries, they means 
with no few rights, forced to pay the fidya, which was a tax to ensure their protection. Our ancestors chose instead the path of resistance, to live freely, but never in isolation. It is indeed in these mountains that the Maronites envisioned a model of social, economic, and political coexistence that paved the way for the creation of a democratic, plural, and modern nation, Lebanon. Under oppressive third Ottoman rule, Maronites introduced as early as 1585 the first printing press in the Middle East at the Kadisha Valley. I heard you were going to visit the Ashaya Kavan in the Kadisha Valley, the Valley of the Saints, where we had the first printing press in 1585, less than 100 years after the creation of the press, the Ottoman printing press. Lebanese Christians who were at the heart of the Hanahda in the 19th century, the Arabic cultural renaissance, also protected cultural diversity by preserving the Arabic language. In line with the same vision, Maronites established a partnership with the Druze community in Mount Lebanon to lay the foundation for the creation of Greater Lebanon in 1920, at the time when Patriarch Hawaii went to the Versailles uh, conference to establish and to ask for great freedom. So, you know, all the leaders of the world were there and they said, well, we, we saw a very big man with a great beard asking for great freedom. Yes, it was a, a choice of Patriarch Hawaii of our church to ask for great freedom, the only pluralistic democracy in the region that Pope John Paul II described as more than a country. It is a message of freedom and an example of pluralism for East and West. This is how throughout history, the land of the free became the nation of freedom. Lebanon was before becoming a nation and a country in the legal sense of it, was the land of freedom. And, and that was a choice, and this is why I said at the beginning that it was not just a historical coincidence. It was a choice that we have fought for and that we paid a very high, heavy price to keep this choice, the choice of freedom. Enough with history. Where do we stand today? What are our options? And how can you help? There is no need to tell you, particularly after what we have witnessed over the past few days, week and months, that Lebanon's identity like Iraq and Syria, is at risk. And I really would like to thank you for being here in Lebanon in this difficult period. That was a courageous choice, and I hope, and I hope, I know you will not regret it. Thank you, really. It is not only our entity, borders, sovereignty, and state institutions that are at stake, but also our nation's unique model and identity. This very identity, that makes us all so proud to be Lebanese. This identity that your parents and grandparents have taken with them thousands of miles across the world, yet remain engraved in your genes and hearts and brought you back home decades later. An identity that is being threatened today by extremism, intolerance, violence, the collapse of present states, and the alterations of borders along sectarian lines. Will we accept, during our time, to surrender and give away what our ancestors fought to preserve and build throughout centuries? Is it true, as some are claiming, that we have no choice but to take sides with either shared extremism, represented by Iran and its proxy Hezbollah, or Sunni fanaticism, represented by the likes of ISIS, Daesh, Nusra, and other Al-Qaeda-inspired groups, or Jewish radicalism, represented by Israel's apartheid-like projects, or will we remain defiant and refuse to succumb, just as our ancestors did, to the sectarian madness that is engulfing our region and threatening our very existence? Just like our ancestors before.
before us, we should take action during these critical times. Of course, I asked the question and my answer we will never succumb. Our top priority today should be to prevent the collapse of state institutions, which starts with the election of a new president, the only Christian head of state from Afghanistan to Morocco. And yes, our patriarch is right. It is unacceptable that Christian leaders or MPs participate in blocking this election. It also means the organization of parliamentary elections since June 2013. Normally we should have had parliamentary elections more than a year ago. And the formation of a government that would, one, protect our borders and strengthen our army to prevent the flow of arms and fighters in and out of Lebanon. Restrict the possession of weapons solely under the authority of Lebanese armed forces. I mean, you're coming from countries where this affirmation should be a given. We cannot have a state and a sovereign state with militias and army sharing, and armies sharing, and organized armies sharing this sovereignty. The protection of any state in the world, and we come from tens of countries all over the world, cannot be subcontracted to any militia. This is unfortunately still the case in Lebanon. Third, implement UN resolutions and distance Lebanon from regional conflicts. If we have something to do in the coming months and years, it is to make this country survive and protect its government. Because even a weak government, even a weak state, is better than no state. Just like our ancestors before us, we are demanded today to hold on the values of freedom, pluralism, moderation, and modernism. Despite the dramatic events and mounting extremism that we have witnessed over the past few months, I stand firmly by what I had stated last November on the 24th commemoration of my father, President Rani Mahal's assassination. We, the moderates, represent a clear majority not only in Lebanon, but throughout the region. Nevertheless, a moderate majority can be irrelevant if it remains passive and silent in the face of an active, and ex ex and of an active extremist minority. So our goal is to get this majority be an active majority with a clear vision and a clear project. Therefore, Lebanese Christians should join hands with moderate Muslim Arabs both Sunnis and Shias, to play an active role in combat combating extremism. We should by no means fight fire with fire, or extremism with extremism, but rather join forces with moderates to fight all forms of extremism. There is not good extremism and bad extremism. All extremisms are bad, and all extremisms represent a real threat the, to the mere identity of Lebanon. While a strong state and moderation are the main two pillars of the Christian presence in Lebanon, the Lebanese diaspora can play a more active role in supporting the third pillar, that is economic growth. Knowing that today, today's Lebanon, today Lebanon's expat community contributes close to $8 billion annually in capital inflows to their homes. Eight billion dollars represent more than 20% of Lebanon's GDP. So bear in mind that without you, your parents, your families, and the capital inflow that you're sending annually to Lebanon, Lebanon's economy would have collapsed. Because the importance of this inflow resides in the fact that it naturally is very well distributed to the poor and has created over the last years and decades a real safety net to Lebanon's economy. While Lebanon's role as a trade hub between the West and the East, this role that we have very well played from our creation, especially our independence in 1943, to the Lebanese war. 
This role has been fading because the idea of a middleman between Est and West in economy, modern economy with globalization, is no more a strategic role. With, with the rise of cities like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, the country could still offer much in high value added services to the Lebanese diaspora, mainly in the banking, tourism, and IT sector. However, this requires bridging the gap between the diaspora and the motherland. The, the Lebanese diaspora has rights in them. You have rights in them. And we need to further pressure the Lebanese state for it to meet its obligation. Spe its obligations, especially when it comes to issues related to the reacquisition of the Lebanese nationality. And this is what the, Leban the Maronite Foundation in the world this is our first goal. The right to vote abroad and land ownership. But beyond the unfulfilled duties of Lebanese public institutions, we should all, the church, and I'm saying all, the church, the diaspora, the private sector, NGOs, we should all join forces to preserve, to preserve, enhance, and protect Christian presence in Lebanon and give Lebanese Christians the opportunity to succeed at home, uh, to succeed at home as they have been doing so well across the world. There's no reason why Lebanese Christians succeed in Latin America, US, Canada, Australia, and do not succeed at home. The only reason is that they are not given those opportunities at home. And we are we're very proud of the Lebanese diaspora all over the world. We still need the Lebanese Christians to keep their land their presence in Lebanon. We should all join forces to invest in land in our country. This, for us, is a question of survival. We indeed largely owe our survival in this part of the world throughout centuries of oppression, to our attachment to land. And we should do what, all what it takes to preserve and enhance that sense of belonging. We should all join forces to invest in Lebanon's economy and to support our families, villages, and regions, not only by building churches, but also by creating jobs, building schools, and a decent infrastructure. With all due respect, Zayn. We should all join forces to organize the Lebanese diaspora into a strong, diverse and united network across the world that rather than export our differences would lobby for the Lebanese cause. We are a democratic country and we have many points of views. But what should unite us is Lebanon, its identity, its state institutions. And this is where we need you. We don't need you to be part of our divisions, which are normal in any democracy. We need you to be diverse, but united in your presence, in your countries, defending the Lebanese cause, the Lebanese identity, the Lebanese state, the Lebanese economy in your countries. My fellow Lebanese, don't give up on Lebanon. Don't give up on our homeland. And thank you.